Hey, Last Looks crew. How is everyone enjoying the summer in the north or the winter in the south? I always feel like a bit of an asshole whenever I share summery things while I'm in LA, as my Kiwi friends and family back home are in the dead of winter, shaking their fists at me. But then when Christmas and New Year come round, I miss the beach time, the holiday vibe and the music festival season in New Zealand. Not to mention our Santa wears board shorts and flip flops, or as we call them, jandals. Anywho, I hope wherever you are, you are enjoying your current season. Speaking of my homeland, New Zealand, I wanted to share with you a little information about a brand that has been created by a fellow Kiwi and makeup artist who works in the film industry. She has lived and worked on set in Hawaii for years. Her name is Natalie Bruce and her brand is Humankind Glow with the amazing tag Human Kind Be Both. I love it. Natalie's brand is born out of wanting to support the youth of today to inspire confidence, self-love and kindness, disrupting unrealistic beauty standards that are on display to our youth on a daily basis. And Natalie sees this firsthand as a mum with teenagers. Now, what is Natalie's brand selling, you ask? Well, (laughs) the cutest heart-shaped pimple patches you ever did see, of course, They are beautiful, simplistic, stylish white hearts. Natalie has other must-check-out items on her website, and the even cooler thing is 20% of the profit is donated to the most vulnerable kids in need. I reached out to Natalie because I was so stoked seeing what she was creating, and I wanted her humankind brand to be known by her fellow hair and makeup artists in the film community. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to offer your cast classy heart-shaped pimple patches created by one of our own, and it's a brand giving back with a purpose, not just another big corporation beauty brand? So if you want to stock your personal and professional kits with humankind goodies, you, my Last Looks crew, can use the link humankindglow.com forward slash last looks for your 10% discount. You heard me, 10% off your entire order. And if you've got a memory like me, pretty terrible, and won't remember that link, well, you can find it anytime in the show notes for this episode. There's also a link in the bio on our Last Looks Instagram page, lastlooks.crew. Okay, let's kick into this rerun episode with hairstylist Lawrence Davis. Funnily enough, I remember thinking to myself recording this back in late 2020, I hope my paths cross with Lawrence's one day. And sure enough, in 2021, I had the opportunity when I came onto the TV show, The First Lady. I was a personal for Michelle Pfeiffer and Lawrence was running the hair department for the first block of shooting. I love how things like that work out. And then we were nominated for an Emmy, which was a wonderful bonus. Okay. My name is Jamie Lee, a hairstylist working in film, and this is The Last Looks Podcast, a show where I catch up with hair and makeup artists working in the film industry around the world. And today on this rerun episode, I'm chatting with hairstylist Lawrence Davis. On with the show. And now, our feature presentation. Picture up. Last Looks. Rolling. Welcome to the Last Looks Podcast, Lawrence. Thank you for having me. Hey, you're very welcome. I would like you to finish this sentence for me, okay? Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Lawrence, and when he grew up, he wanted to be... A hairstylist in Hollywood. (laughs) Oh, you did? (laughs) No, he he really wanted to be a singer. (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah. (laughs) I went to performing arts high school, and I was a voice major, and um, that's what I thought I was going to be, a singer, but... uh, Changed it changed to something else. <laughs> I'm sure you still sing. I mean, a little, it's not yeah. Like, yeah. I do a little. I sure do. So <laughs> that's good. Good to hear. I like where I am, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, how did you move from performing arts college and everything into the hair world? You know, when the real world hit me, like after school, it was like, okay, you've got to figure out something. And you know, I knew that it was it would be some sort of. Uh, artsy thing. I just didn't know exactly what, because when I was in high school, I actually had a knack for sewing. And mm-hmm. I think I sewed my way through high school. There was one girl <laughs> who was a, a friend of mine who said she wasn't going to go to prom because she didn't have mm-hmm. anything to wear. And 
all these mm-hmm. other things. It was a financial thing as well. And I went, oh, I'll make it for you. Yeah. And it started right there, actually. I knew that, you know, the basics from doing pillows and home economics and all that stuff that, you know, it, yeah. it's just a back in the front, stitch it together and you've got something. So I yeah. wind up making something for her and it became this whole thing. It, it, there are so many things that I made I don't even remember. I look through pictures and I'm going, I made that? But, you know, that was one of the easy things for me at that time um, besides singing. Mm-hmm. And once I finished school, I always had a knack for cutting hair. I remember sewing, cutting hair, just little things, side jobs to make money for myself straight yeah. out of school because I didn't I didn't exactly want to go to college, but I didn't I did not want to go as well. I think I was a little mm-hmm. intimidated by the thought of going away to college and I was a bit afraid and did not do it. So I knew that my hustle would have to be whatever it is that I like doing and whatever was comfortable for me. And sewing and uh, cutting hair at that time was something that I made money doing. That's very cool. So it's just like, it sounds like you just had a, a natural confidence of working with your hands, like to be able to just embark on actually cutting hair. Because I think even for some people who know that they want to be a hairstylist, that haircutting bit is, there's such a wall in between them and getting to that. They're so scared yeah. of it. There's that fear. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like you just broke through that I, straight away. I did. You know, it was one of those things where once I started, you know, I, I was always cutting my own hair. And then I will say, I'll go back a little. My mom used to cut my hair. And um, mm-hmm. my mom had said I'm seven brothers, so she was great at cutting hair. And she used to cut mm-hmm. my hair. And then I'd learned to do it myself. And from there, it kind of went to my friends in the neighborhood. And then, you know, it just became this thing where I had a regular clientele and didn't, didn't even realize it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it just kind of... This, this thought hit me one day, what if I just do everybody, you know, not just the guys, if I can just do the girls mm-hmm. as well. And that's when the light bulb went off, go to hair school, okay, become a cosmetologist, get your license and you can do it all and you be your own boss. And that's what I did. I worked part time and I went to school full time. So where did you grow up? Where were you doing all of this? I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Oh, cool. Right outside of, uh, uh, right, uh, surrounded by D.C. and Philadelphia, but Baltimore is nestled mm-hmm. right there. And um, I went to high school there and I went to hair school there as well. And I think that after graduating hair school, I remember it was Friday, I went to the salon on Saturday morning. Mm. <laughs> and I was scared to death. <laughs> What do you mean? I was the only, I was the new kid on the block. So it was like. Oh yeah. First day of school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. First day of school. All <laughs> eyes on you. I've got seven clients coming in and, you know, just take a deep breath and jump in there. So I remember that day very, very well. And it, it turned out to be a great day, but I'll never forget it. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you, how did you have that job lined up? Was that a salon that you'd kind of been going to, to do work experience stuff or training? Or? Ironically, there were two friends of mine who owned the salon and they had just opened the salon a few months before I finished hair school. Oh, cool. Yeah. Wow, so I had a job waiting for me the day I graduated. So that was a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Just to be able to step straight into it. Yeah, Absolutely. But prior to that, I did do an apprenticeship um, at a wonderful salon in uh, Mount Washington, in the area of Maryland and Baltimore. And I think I was just a little, a little uh, anxious to, to move forward faster. So I left that job and went straight to hair school so I could finish in nine months as opposed to two years of apprenticeship. Right. Yeah. I didn't know there was an apprenticeship option. There was, and I think there still is in Maryland. Oh, but cool. although I'm still licensed there, I'm not sure if the, if the rules have changed for the apprenticeship program. Yeah, that was a learning curve for me coming over here, realizing that there's a different license for each state. And I was yeah. Just like, what? Okay. <laughs> exactly. It was like that. And when I when I came to uh, Los Angeles, I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to do my license here, and this, and that, and this, and that. But once I was eligible to join the union, and I, I spoke with them, they were like, oh, as long as you're licensed in your home town and we verify that and you're good i was like oh that's great <laughs> so oh that's good yeah i didn't realize that that's fantastic that so worked out perfectly that's awesome so you're you've stepped out of um cosmetology school straight into a salon how long do you stay doing salon work wow i did i i, I stayed at that salon for about maybe a year and a half and then mm-hmm. i i uh, went into business with another person and we we launched a salon together Oh, cool. Yeah, we did that. And then after maybe about a year or two in that business with that particular person, I found a building 
and I was able to purchase the building. It was a small little building near Johns Hopkins University, and it was the perfect, perfect spot for a salon. I bought that building and I had a salon downstairs and I had an apartment upstairs. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> I mean, you're never getting away from work, but still. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the commute's like zero. <laughs> yeah. It was one of those things that, you know, you have not because you ask not. I, I, just, I just saw this little building there sitting on the corner and it was just perfect. And I was like, Mm. Who owns this building? So literally, I would get out of the car and I just kind of started knocking on doors. Do you know who owns that building? Do you know who owns that building? And one lady led me to a gentleman who had a uh, a little restaurant a few blocks away, and it was his building. And he actually mm. sold that building to me. So it was, wow. a, it was a blessing in disguise. And I did that for about five years, and I kind of got tired of uh, <laughs> the salon. Mm. I got tired of the salon, and I wanted to venture out. And I had been thinking about the entertainment industry for a while. And with Baltimore being just down the road from New York, uh, like a mm-hmm. three hour drive, I would frequent New York a lot doing photo shoots and things like that. Just test shoots, trying to find an agency once I realized how to get into, you know, get an agent and what it took to get uh, tear sheets and to get, to get spreads and magazines. Once I researched yeah. all of that stuff, I started going to New York a lot. And one day it hit me. I said, you know what? I really like the entertainment part of this, and I think I'd love to go to Los Angeles. I know it's furthest away, but mm. you got to surround yourself by what you want to be a part of is what I thought. And I literally remember going to the store on lunch break, and I picked up a magazine, and I remember coming back to the salon, sitting in the chair, and just kind of browsing through this magazine. And this magazine featured a story on Halle Berry and her hairstylist at the time. Mm. And I was so inspired by that story that... I said to myself, it was April of 2001, Yeah, I'm going to go to LA. And the following mm-hmm. holiday, that I think was April. So the following holiday after that was Memorial Day. I mm-hmm. flew out to LA, got a hotel, flew out to LA, LA that weekend. It was Memorial Day weekend. There wasn't much going on at all. Everything was kind of quiet because of the holiday. But I just yeah. wanted to get a feel for Los Angeles. So Mm. I remember staying downtown LA at the time and it was like a ghost town. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't what it is now, but it was a ghost yeah. town, but you know, I got rented a car and I just drove around to spots that I kind of read about and found. And in that weekend, there was a friend of mine who from the very first salon that I worked in in Baltimore had a friend living in Los Angeles and he gave me his information and I called him and he said, Hey, you know, if you'd like to go out to eat or something, um, you know, please give me a call. So I gave him a call and come to find out he knew the owner of one of the salons that I had read about. Uh And I met her and she said she had a chair available. If I was ever in LA and wanted a job, I could definitely work there. And not only that, he knew someone who owned a fourplex and there was an apartment available. Oh (laughs) my goodness. So with that, I said, uh, you know what? I think I'm going to say Yes, I'll take the apartment and yes, I'll take the job. Yeah. <laughs> I remember flying back home just really excited, like, okay, what have I just done? <laughs> yeah. Am I crazy? No, Am this I... is exciting. <laughs> exactly. Because I knew no one there, absolutely no one. But I, I know I had read about so many different things and I wanted to just check it out for myself. So once I got back to my salon, I announced, hey guys, I'm uh, moving to LA. And everybody's like, sure, yeah, right. <laughs> And the first day in the class, we're like, what am I supposed to do? And I'm like, well, um, I'll make sure you're in good hands and uh, this, that, this, that, you know. So Mm -hmm. I kept going back and forth in my head as to when I would like to make the move and I wanted to sell the salon and all this stuff. And I did put the salon on the market and it wasn't selling right away. And I had actually gone to the calendar and marked down July 27th, 2001 is the day I'm Mm going to move to L.A. Yeah. And once I did that, it was kind of set in stone. I purchased mm. my ticket one way and I said, well, if the salon doesn't sell, I'll get my mom to just kind of oversee the whole selling process. So I did that and the salon sold shortly after I left for Los Angeles. But once I got to LA, I remember standing outside of LAX with my box and my boxes and mags and this feeling of fear just fell over me. Like <laughs> it was like, what the hell have you done? 
<laughs> I normally feel that when I'm in the plane on the place to where I'm like on the journey. I don't feel anything. I'm just excited and stuff until I get on the plane yeah. and we take off and my feet aren't touching the ground anymore. And I'm like, what am I doing? Jamie, it was, what am I doing? <laughs> it was the craziest thing because like I said, I knew no one except the gentleman mm. I met through a friend. And I knew of a, a, a guy from Baltimore who moved out there, but I didn't know how to reach him. I didn't know any, you know, any numbers or anything like that. And yeah, just moved into my place, bought a little furniture, and I started. I started working at that salon. And at that time, I was renting a chair, and so I had no clients, but I was renting a chair every week. So my savings were dwindling down. <laughs> I was mm. like, oh gosh. So what I did was um, I just stuck it out, and I started meeting people and. Um, I remember one day I actually had a photo shoot that I did with um, Essence Magazine. I met a young lady there. I was a makeup artist and she was a makeup artist at E! Entertainment Television, which which I was obsessed with the entire time I was on the East Coast because it was all I had. So I was obsessed with that network and she and I were talking and she's like, well, you know, I'll give them your name uh, at the studio and uh, maybe you can come over and work, you know, work sometime, freelance, I mean, uh, fill in sometimes. Mm. And it actually worked out. I became a freelancer at E! Entertainment and I was there literally for years. Three years of that, of course, I, I became eligible for 706 after three years of uh, 60, 60, 60. Yeah. Days. And... Literally, E! Entertainment was a revol- is a revolving door. Everybody came through there. Everybody came through E! News. Everybody came through the talk shows. Everybody came through E! True Hollywood Stories. They'd set- they would send me out to do clients, you know, for those particular tapings. So I met a lot of people through E! Yeah. e- Entertainment. I remember after leaving there, I would still get calls on wood season to do red carpet and to do... Um, E coverage of the um, Oscars and all those shows. So it was great, mm-hmm. great family over there. And I'm still friends with them as till this day. But that afforded me the opportunity to get into 706 and to get more into the film and the uh, movie world, I mean, the movie and television yeah. world. So I was grateful for that journey. It was really, really all designed for me. I had no idea, but it all worked out. The, not, the dots connected. And mm-hmm. Here I am today, still doing it. <laughs> That's very cool. So, when you first moved to LA, and you know you wanted to kind of get into the entertainment industry, were you aware of what kind of hoops you'd have to jump through with the union and stuff like that, or did that kind of come along as you were starting to work? It kind of came along someone? as I met people and got more, you know, had more questions about it, and just found yeah. out exactly what it took to get there. And once I started making calls and going through contract services, just adding, you know, adding, adding things up and writing things down and seeing exactly what the process was. I thought, well, I've got a journey ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. But I think being a full-time freelancer at E! Entertainment uh, five days a week afforded me the opportunity to have income as well as free time to do, you know, other jobs and to network and meet other people. So that was a great, um, way to get in and still have a a decent income while trying to get into the union. So all of that just worked out. I'm just grateful for that. And it just became more and more of a, it became more and more of a family and all the dots connected. I just met the right people and are still friends with those people today. That's very cool. I love making those relationships and those connections. Absolutely. With yeah. Absolutely. Um, so once you're in the union, what happens then? So things open up a bit more for you. So where do you go to from there? You know, once I got in, I, I you know, became, got on the roster and just through people that I met going to meetings and things like that. I will say, now I want to back up a little bit because I remember, uh-huh. <laughs> I remember, before I got into 706, a little before that, I met Tyra and I started working at the Tyra show. And I, Tyra Banks. Tyra Banks, yes, I'm sorry. I started yeah. working at Tyra's mm-hmm. show and yeah. I met her through Nico, who was Hallie's hairstylist. I met him through actually a classmate of mine in hair school. She came out to LA and she took his class. I had no idea where he was or how to meet him, but I remember reading about, mm-hmm. I remember him, that article about him just inspired me so yeah. much. So, I went to drop her off at his class and uh, he invited me to sit in on his class. And one thing led to another. I wind up working at his salon and I met so many people through him. He was so generous and he's just one of the people that I always tell people um, 
just gave me an opportunity that no one else would have given me. And shortly after working at his salon, I remember the full circle day that I met Hallie at a photo shoot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was like, oh gosh, I just read about this guy and, and Hallie yeah. earlier this year. <laughs> and it was just the most amazing experience. But I met Tyra through Nico also. And I went to a few shoots with, with Nico and to cover Tyra when he wasn't able to stay with her. And that led to me doing Tyra and having Tyra as a client and doing Top Model and the talk show. And I remember yeah. my first Emmy win was for Tyra's show. That's so exciting. It was so exciting. But, you know, I never knew that was uh, that could be a part of what we did. I never knew that was a part of uh, being a hairstylist in Hollywood. I never knew we yeah. got those kind of uh, awards and things like that. So I say that to yeah. say that my first union meeting was right after I won my Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm here. I have arrived. <laughs> so, I remember going to my union meeting. It was on a Sunday, and I went to church that day, and I came in with a suit and bow tie on, and I was like, uh-oh. It was one of those. <laughs> they were nice and cordial, but it was just a weird, weird situation. But I always remember that because there's some, some great people that I met there who were kind enough to call me for projects and allow me to day play with them and become a part of their uh, work family. And it just, you know, it just opened doors for me, not the Emmy itself, but the relationships I developed through meeting people at the union meeting. And it became uh, just an extended family for me because I had no family out there. So my work Mm -hmm. family was my family and still is. That's very cool. I I love all of what you're saying. It's so exciting. (laughs) I mean, just, just to be... It's so funny, I find, that so many of us, I think, whether we're makeup or hair or, uh-huh. and you're kind of growing up and looking at things. And I mean, you watch movies and you mm-hmm. watch TV, mm-hmm. and, but it's, it's, it, it kind of gets to a point where the dots kind of join and you're like, uh, somebody does that person's hair and makeup yeah. for that show? Exactly. Is that a job? Exactly. That's a job? <laughs> oh my goodness. And then you have that, like you read the magazine, you, you look at this particular person, hairstylist who's, you know, inspires yeah. you, you meet this person, which yeah. is crazy amazing. You know, it was, um, it, there were days when I literally had to pinch myself because I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. But it also so cool. was one of those situations. It was also that reminder that you had to be around it to be a part of it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you hadn't been in Los Angeles, you never would have. Never. Would have met. Yeah. <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. So I'm quite interested in just the differences because you've you've gone from like e live news, the talk shows, doing the awards, red carpet, all these types of things, like in reality TV, mm-hmm. and then you've done like drama TV and feature films. And yeah. what do you find to be the difference in those working environments? Because I've never, I personally have never done, you know, like a reality show or a mm-hmm. talk show or. I, I haven't actually done anything live before yeah. either. So what's what, what do you find to be the differences? Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because the world of talk show is very nine to five. And when I booked my first talk show with Tyra, we were also doing top model. So basically we were doing a nine to five and then we would leave there in the evenings and we would do top models. So, <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> I was going to say that you eased into it was nine to five, but no, you were yeah. <laughs> moonlighting. <laughs> right. It became something else. But, it would be, but the exciting part about it was that world at that particular time was very creative because, you know, doing top mm-hmm. model, we, we were doing a lot of high fashion stuff and, uh, yeah talk show was, you know, a little bit more reserved, but they're all kind of dynamics. We did t- a lot of fashion shows and makeovers and things like that. So that made the day really, really cool and fun. And mm-hmm. the evenings would be the top model competition, uh, huge photo shoots, uh, different competitions, of course, between the girls, but it just yeah. opened up so many fun things in the hair world. And then once I got into more of the scripted, I, think I remember getting called for J. Edgar Hoover to work on that. And that was one of the mm-hmm. first period movies that I was called for. And the time span was from the early 1920s up to, I think, the early 70s. 
Yeah. So I got to do hair for all of those periods and, and anything in between. So that right there was a different structure for me, but just to be creative in that world was such a high. And it definitely gave me a sense of uh, storytelling and being able to show, actually show periods in time through hairstyles. Um, mm. It just gave me a whole another sense of, of how creative we can be in our field and how we can tell a story through what we do. Yeah, so once, once I started getting calls for that and other stuff, I just love the way that it worked out. I just love the way that I love the process from being called for a project to seeing that project on the big screen, you know, and everything mm. between. It just was, it's just a, a, an exciting process. And it allows you to, like I say, tell a story from start to finish through your craft. And yeah. once I started getting calls for uh, other projects from other people and then getting asked to be in a key position, which was more responsibility just under the hair mm-hmm. department head. It just gave me more knowledge of what I needed to do to do a TV show or do a movie and from reading the script to breaking the script down to creating characters and collaborating with actors on the way they want to look and the way that I think they should look. And we coming to a happy medium and creating these characters that come to light. So it's just, you know, just the whole process became this whole buildup of just, just creativity. It just became, yeah. it became satisfaction and it became an expression of what we do. That's very cool. And I mean, you've done quite a few period projects now. You've done like Mudbound, mm-hmm. that was like post World War II. Yeah. Was it? And then Watchmen, you had a bit of a flashback for the 1921 Tulsa. Yeah, that was amazing. And that was fun to work on because Watchmen was such, <laughs> Watchmen was such a, uh, how do I how do I explain it? Watchmen was all it was everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it was the past. It was the present. It was just yeah. a whole different uh, world, and I had so much fun there because we never knew from episode to episode where we're going to end up. Once you read it, you're like, oh, we're 1920. Oh, we're 1950. Oh, we're 1970. Oh, we're 2019. Uh, you know, so it was just that whole cool. element of surprise and just having to be able to do storyboards and uh, creative boards on looks at that particular time. It was mm-hmm. just the whole buildup of the energy of it. It just kind of kept you on your toes and it kept you guessing. It kept, of course, viewers guessing, like, where are we going next? But even, yeah. even with Mudbound, when I, when I did Mudbound, I got the call for from D Reese, who I had worked with previously. She's a great director that I did Bessie with. Yeah. And Bessie was a beautiful story from the 1930s. That was my first department head job on a period movie. Yeah. That one right there. And that scared the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I, pre- I prepared for it. I researched everything I could possibly research. I, I knew the rules of what was worn and what was not worn and what was mm-hmm. popular and what wasn't popular. And I had a great team. And that made a difference because it's never me. I can't do it myself. You you have to have the right team and everybody can compliment everybody and what one person can't do, another person can do. And we all learn from each other, you know? So having the right team is definitely important when it comes to doing movies, especially a period movie and, you know, people having knowledge of this and knowledge of that and us putting it all together, creating a wonderful project. And when I did Mudbound, Mudbound was a different project because it was a a very low budget. But once I read the script, it wasn't even about the money. It was about the story and the creativity of it. And it was one of the hardest jobs I had to do only because we did it in New Orleans in the summer. It was very, very, very hot, (laughs) very hot. And (laughs) it was a challenge and it was shooting around uh, nighttime and bugs and you know, that part, you just had to suck it up and think about the bigger picture. And at that yeah. time, I had Mary J. Blige, uh, who played Florence. I had Carrie Mulligan, who played the wife. And we just had a great time. Everybody was there for it. Everybody was a, wanted to be a part of it. And when an actor wants to be a part of a project and everybody mm-hmm. else involved wants to be a part of the project, it makes it such a smooth uh, transition. To It makes it a smooth uh a way to segue into getting that project done and completed and having quality work. 
Yeah. When I, I think when the cast really want to lean into it, I mean, even if it's just leaning into their look or leaning yeah. into their period and you're just like, yes, they're willing to go there. Yeah. This is awesome. Exactly. It's so exciting. Exactly. And with um, Bessie, I'm guessing, was that the first time also recreating yes. historical figures as well? It was on my own, yes. Um, I, like, I, I did work, like I said, on uh, J, J. Edgar Hoover, but on my own mm. as a department head, yes, it was my first time. Yeah. And it was just, uh, um, it was my first time on a period piece, excuse me, as a department head. And it was just one of those things where I knew that once I studied the look of that period, I know it was one of my favorite times uh, in history to do hair, to create those looks. I just knew that I needed to stay within the parameters of what was worn and what was not worn in order to have an authentic looking project. Yeah. Did you have images of Bessie Smith to kind of Absolutely. I and I had images of everybody <laughs> that I yeah. could think of who was alive at that time, whether they were African yeah. American or non African American. I just wanted everybody to look authentic. So I pulled references from everywhere that I possibly could and thank God for Pinterest and the internet and things like that mm. that we have today that we can you know and then i pulled some great found some great books that i uh, ordered and they were just the best references and just make a wonderful collection just to have in general that's awesome i think like i found in the past that it's it, i can get on this this journey of wanting everybody to look just like mm -hmm. the person mm -hmm. but then at the same time there are characters in the film who did exist but nobody knows what they look like mm -hmm. so <laughs> you do have a little bit of wiggle wiggle room there exactly. sometimes i think and it's always the director who kind of goes did you know who this person was before you started working on this no we, yep don't they don't have to look just like you know there's a little bit of wiggle room <laughs> yeah, don't exactly. worry about it you're probably introducing this person you know, for the first time. People. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you want to, you know, you want to do right by that person. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I think yeah. the kind of balance of getting that, that look right to it really recreate, is. but also it's got to look right on the actor themselves. Yeah. And it really has to resonate through them because they want to bring this character forth the best they can. And they want to be comfortable. Mm. They definitely yeah. want to be comfortable in that particular wig or that particular look that they're going to have to wear for, you know, at least anywhere from six to eight, 12 weeks, however long we're filming. So it's definitely that collaboration and that comfort level and that journey that's going to make everything flow and make everything smooth. Yeah. And then also you did Just Mercy. So what mm -hmm. was that, like 1989, early 90s? Yeah, Just Mercy was a, it was a South and it was in the early 90s, but they were still, I would say in my research, I still found that some of the people in there were still uh, locked in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing. Whenever there's a period piece, whether it's 80s, 90s, whatever, you kind of have to pull from a few years before that because you always have, you know, that old lady who still gets her roller set that she's always been getting. So it may be 1970, but she still gets her 60s, 1960s roller set because that's her look. Yeah, everyone's not high fashion. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Everybody's not up to date. So with Just Mercy, I did some research and, you know, did people and how they looked at that particular time in the South. And I found that some of them were still in the 80s look more so than the 90s because of where they lived. So it all made sense once I started to research it. And I thought that, you know, this is a great thing because a lot of people would probably go, oh, it's got to be 90s. It's got to be 90s. But in reality, it's it's got to be late 80s, mid 80s early nineties, all of that together. Yeah. So it gives you a nice variety too, right? It really, it really did. It really did. And that was such a wonderful story and such a wonderful cast. And uh, we did it here in Atlanta and we did some in Alabama, a few days in Alabama as well. But it was definitely fun to play with those looks as well. It, it just, you know, it, it, I love to see it all come together, whether it's the uh, hair, the makeup costumes, or even the set, you know, we're walking around buildings every day that have, that have been here for hundreds of years. But, you know, you put the right car and the right people dressed in front of those buildings and that building comes alive. I know. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. It's like that yeah. architecture has been there for years and we never paid attention to it until we put a 1930s Cadillac in front of it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's that. very cool. It's so funny because you, I mean, when you're prepping, you're kind of really focused on here, here, here. Yeah. And then you start working with, 
with you know you see the fittings and the costume mm -hmm. and then yeah that day that first day that you get that character ready from start to finish and they step on set and you're like yes, yeah it's so exciting <laughs> is that it's a final puzzle piece like just popping it in there you're exactly like, yeah, you know and when this looks amazing exactly and there's sometimes when i'm a little like in a in a I'm a little stuck sometimes. So what mm -hmm. I do, I take a journey through production office and I go through the costume room and I, I walk their aisles and I look at their look boards and I'm like, ah, mm. aha. <laughs> I never looked at that picture. I never found that picture on, on uh, Pinterest. Can I have that picture? So it's all yeah. that pulling that together, just walking through other departments and just seeing even props and things like that. It's like little things come together and it all just works and creates the perfect picture. That's very cool. I was going to um, bring up Respect as well, the uh, Aretha Franklin story that you've oh, recently wow. done. It's not out yet, so yeah. don't get too excited, people, but <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. It's um, coming. And that's a period piece, isn't it? Yeah. And recreating. That was great. That was all, uh, I want to say we started, we started with young Aretha. So we started with the late, late 40s, mid 40s. Mm -hmm. Aretha was a kid. So we That's traveled awesome. from uh, the 40s through the 70s. So wow. it's it's one of those situations where, you know, of course, there's just different looks and different times, but it was so much fun and so beautiful to do because of the period of times. Um, and then it was like everyday life in those particular days, but there was also performance life for Aretha and performance life for other characters in the movie. So got to do, you know, of course the reserve look, but we got to do the, 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 the fashion and the performance looks of the girl groups back then and the men and, and, and uh, uh, Ella Fitzgerald and just singers from that era who she was inspired by, who were friends with her dad, even the gospel singer, Clara Ward, who was known for having the biggest hair in the gospel world back then. So we got to do some great work and just it's just a great story that basically tells of her childhood and her journey as uh, Aretha, young Aretha and her record labels and her relationship with her labels. And it goes to her latest project that came out, I think a year or two ago with her uh, her documentary, the gospel documentary. And that's where the, the movie ends. So we got to full, we got a full flow of her looks from uh, her childhood in the forties all the way up to 1972. That's very cool. Yeah. It must have been fun for you too, just having that singing background and loving music and, uh, and being there for something like that with Bessie as well. I mean, absolutely. it's very cool. You know, just being on set and having a day where it's nothing but music. It's just mm. so cool just to be there. It's like, you know, being at work of course, but being back in time and feeling that music and feeling the the whole tone of what they they were going through or the whole feeling of the juke joint or the whole feeling of Aretha being in the recording studio at that particular time surrounded by her band you know wow. all of that just having to sit there and listen to that music and reconnecting with it in this present day and and listening to the lyrics and making more sense of it now that you really know exactly what it says <laughs> yeah. instead of instead of what you thought it said as a kid you know the real words but you know all of those i will say that one of my favorite things to do are period pieces i will definitely say yeah. that it's it's just it's just a world that i love to dive into oh that's very cool mm -hmm. um and what was jennifer hudson yes jennifer aretha? jennifer played aretha and jennifer has been a client of mine for years i i met jennifer i think in the I'm sorry, 19. In 2006. Okay. No. Uh, yeah. No, it was before that. I met Jennifer in LA and we've been friends ever since. We've been friends like a, a good 15 years now. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. I was going to say, because you've done personal work for a few people, yes. right? Like Tyra and Mahershala Ali Mahershala, as well. I met Mahershala um, in LA. He gave me a call, actually. It was, it was referred to him. He gave me a call and he came at a great time because I was finishing up a show called Claws in New Orleans. And that started... That looked like fun, that I'm just going to say. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah. That was a lot of fun, but it was a heavy female show. So there were five mm. females. And literally, I remember finishing that show and I said, God, could you please send me a male client? <laughs> 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 I did. Yeah. Jamie, I kid you not. I, I said, I 
I was specific in what I asked for. And I said, God, please send me a male client. I would love to have a male client. <laughs> and yeah. I kid you not, not even three weeks later, Mahershala Ali reached out. That's amazing. And <laughs> I went out to LA. I was out there uh, day playing with some friends over at So You Think You Can Dance, All Stars, which I would love. I, I do that every year when I have time off. I go out there and just, you know, hang out and work with friends. And I met with right. him. We had lunch. And he told me about uh, Green Book, which was a project that was coming up. And he told me about True Detective. And I did both of those projects with him and they both were period pieces as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then also with um, True Detective, you've got like, was it three different looks oh, throughout the show? Gosh, yes. We him? went from we went from mid eighties all the way up to 2015. And he yeah. uh, his character aged about 40 years. And just being able to be a part of collaborating with uh, special effects makeup and doing his look as the older, the older detective just was a great experience. I think that, you know, typically people go, well, you know, when they get older, we're going to have this receding hairline. I was like, no, nah, I don't think he should have a receding hairline. I said, not everybody who goes, who goes older, you know, lose, mm. the, lose their hair. So mm. with this character, he was able to have, you know, full head of gray hair, but still aging and still aged as a uh, uh, African-American man would. And it was just wonderful just to be a part of that whole creative process and having these looks and the four hours of makeup every morning for him and me mm. and me coming in after and topping it off with the wig. It just was the icing on the cake. And having him as a client, oh gosh, is the most wonderful thing as well. He's a great, great, great guy and just wonderful to work with. But um, Yeah, I think you can see that come through in his work. Like he's... Oh, he's, I mean, he's amazing. Yes. He's amazing to watch. Absolutely. And it just, you can, I don't know, you can just see in those eyes that there's a kindness in there. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I definitely got my prayers answered when I asked for the, that male client and and it was him. So. <laughs> so going into those looks a little bit more, because I'm interested as to how you did that. Because I know in his younger years in that um, in that show, he had like a cropped, like he was kind of had a fade. Yeah, right? it was clipped down was through faded, the side of the back, he, right? was, he was former military in that storyline anyway. Mm. So to segue from a former military to a police detective kind of, you know, was the look of the time anyway for tapered haircut. And we did some research for a lot of the eighties detective shows for African-American men. And we did in the heat of the night as a reference, we did Sydney Portier as a reference. And mm -hmm. we came up with these different looks for the eighties, nineties, as well as the two thousands for him. And they all kind of fit perfectly into those eras. Yeah. And what we did was with uh, the more tapered look, we definitely used his own hair for those looks in the early uh, 80s and uh, early 90s. And then as we segued, I'm sorry, in the early 80s, we did more of a uh, tapered look, but it was a wig because it was tapered, but just low cut. Um, okay. And then in the 90s, we did, uh, we were... We wore, he wore his own hair and we did the tapered cut with more of a little high top fade. And mm -hmm. then the wig was more of his look for his elderly uh, years. But it was definitely a, a collaboration of pulling pictures and references and seeing exactly how to go back and forth between these characters while filming. Not in order, of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> while no, filming. never. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So while filming, it's like, okay, we're in the 80s this day. Uh, we're in the 90s. So maybe we'll cut it today for the 90s and make sure we'll wig it and we'll make sure it's fresh tomorrow morning. You know, it's just that whole juggling, that juggling mm -hmm. act that made it interesting. But it worked out so fine because, you know, we just had it all put together and we knew exactly what the looks were during camera tests and tweaking this and tweaking that. And, you know, it just made sense once we all sat down and figured out the looks on him as well as... Steven's character and Carmen Jogo's character just they all just fell in together and of course the collaboration with makeup and costumes just made it all perfect yeah who was doing the aging makeup on on True Detective on True Detective it was Mike Marino's team out of New York oh, cool. yeah they mm -hmm. were amazing and Diana Choi did Mahershala's wig and she did uh, Steven's wig as well She's amazing, and awesome. I love Diana Choi. I love her work. Mm. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a great watch. I I love those those series. Dang. And then when I saw the shorts for that, I was just like, oh yeah, I've got to watch this season. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> just some great <laughs> stuff. I I. I I will say I've been blessed to do some great stuff and I look forward to just doing more stuff in the future. And, you know, I just love creating characters. 
I love creating yeah. characters that resonate and that people can relate to when it comes to storytelling, whether it's a movie or series or even um, fashion or red carpet, whatever. I just love being able to create it and be a part of the process. Yeah, I think that must come through just because your excitement for storytelling and things like that. Because, I mean, you've worked on some incredibly moving films Mm -hmm. that have significant subjects Mm -hmm. and Mm storylines. So how has that been for you, like, personally, but also as an artist? I mean, we've got The Green Book, Mudbound, Just Mercy, Bessie, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Oh, man. Like, just such a credible story. Yeah, those stories, Um, they're all – and the thing about it is they're all based on truth. So, you know, they're all based on true stories. So it definitely was an educating thing for me because there are things that I wasn't aware of until I read those stories, Um, Mm -hmm. whether it was the actual book or the actual script. um, And doing my research, I was definitely, definitely brought up to date on some of the some of the things that happened and the experiences and who contributed to what in life. And the Henrietta Lacks story was such an amazing story that I was not aware of. And, yeah. you know, at Johns Hopkins, it's the, it's the hospital, the city I was born in. And mm. it's like, you know, to have a story come out of that, the Henrietta Lacks story, have it be such a huge impact on the world and medicine today. It just was wonderful to be a part of that project. Do you want to just briefly explain, just for anyone who hasn't seen it, who should watch it, what the the story is with Henrietta Yes, Henrietta Lacks was a woman who uh, who essentially died from cancer, but her cells multiplied and reproduced themselves. And her cells were used in all kinds of stem cell research and things that were kind of kept quiet, but her cells mm. were the only cells they ever found in a human being that multiplied and were essential to all kinds of vaccines and all kinds of uh, treatments that modern medicine today still use. She was an African-American woman and she wasn't allowed to uh, be treated in certain areas in, in, in Maryland at the time because of the time. And she basically had, I want to say, she gone in for a treatment and when her cells were, you know, when her uh, cells were taken from her body, she had no knowledge of it. So mm-hmm. basically she was curing the world and her story was never told. And basically she was curing the world without her knowing it. So basically everything that was taken from her was being sold all over the world in the mod- in medicine and uh, for cure. She had no idea. She had no yeah. idea. Neither did her family until it, yeah. it all came out. So it's just one of those stories that really, really, when you dig deep inside, knowing that, you know, it was a beautiful African-American woman, woman who, who has saved millions of lives today and miss winfrey um played uh deborah lax who was henrietta's daughter and when i got the call to work with uh, miss winfrey for that of course i said yes right away (laughs) (laughs) because i just knew that there was a great story there and i knew that she would do it some justice absolutely it's amazing i mean all all those films they're just incredible stories and it's i mean you know you're learning from reading the script and then Mm -hmm. working on it but then of course all all the people who get to watch that those films as well yeah it's it's, it's really interesting and then um i was really blessed to see that when the book came out they uh used miss winfrey's picture on the cover of the the book the revised book so it was just wonderful just to have my work there and have her her 18 inch hair in that two inch wig. <laughs> that task of doing that every day. It's just 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 being able to, like I said, build characters and tell stories. And it's just being able to do it with such great people. Uh, I've truly been blessed by that, and I'm grateful for it all the time. Yeah, I I imagine there's times on set with making films like that where it's quite emotional, and you're just needing to be respectful of your space and the actors mm-hmm. and everything like that and their process. Absolutely. So, absolutely. And it, it becomes a, a relationship between you and your actor when you kind of know when to step back and let them have that time. And even with, um, I'll say with the last project I did right before I finished respect, I did underground railroad with Barry Jenkins and that project will be out um, on Amazon probably next year. It was a very, very, sensitive subject matter. Um, and Amazon was amazing with having counselors there so that 
anybody on the crew who felt, you know, some kind of way, you know, had someone to talk to. They were just mindful of the subject matter and the lynchings and the killings and things like that of slaves in, in that area of time, that it was just one of the right things to do as a network. They brought in the right people for sensitive subject matter, whether it was for the actors or the crew members, we all had access to some very, very healthy uh, remedies for that mm-hmm. time. But just having that support system in yeah, place. Yeah, absolutely. So that's great. It's just it's important to be that for your actor, and it's important for a production to be that for you as a crew member. So yeah. I've always had great projects that you know when it came to sensitive subject matter. We've always always been taken care of, definitely. That's good to hear. Mm-hmm. It's very important. <laughs> and I guess when you're going into a job like that as well and you're heading the department, I mean, what are you looking for in your team of hairstylists? I mean, obviously that must come into it as well, that they have an amount of sensitivity to yeah. just what will be going on around them. Definitely. You know, I, I definitely try to bring a team together, not only people that I work with, but people that I would love to you know, develop working relationships with for future projects. Of course, you have to meet them somewhere and they become a part of the team or become a part of a list that you call because you know what they're qualified to do and what they can do. And I try to school everyone on the subject matter ahead of time and make sure that everything's clear as far as the looks we're looking for, the looks we're going for, and the sensitivity of the project or the, or the subject matter. I think with my team, it's always important for me to sit down and go through not only the script, but the time and the period and just what's sensitive, what's, what's, what's not acceptable at that particular time. We're just always aware of what's going on, whether it's the project itself or whether it's the crew or whether it's uh, upper production. Just want everybody to know who everybody is. If we have questions, we'll be able to go ask questions and not be afraid to ask for what we need to be able to create the project or, or what we need to be able to be a strong department. I like to have people who are not afraid to ask for what what's necessary. I'm not that person. Yeah. You know, and I remember, you know, not being able to speak up for things because I was a shy kid. So I, I know that in order to have things and have what's what's needed, you just got to go and ask for it now. That's yeah. It. And I think it's nice that you make it a, a point to make it known that communication is a positive Definitely. thing within the team <laughs> and to keep the, those communication lines open and yeah, and they, they're supported and it sounds good. Yeah, it, def- it, good definitely, it definitely is. And I like to, I like to make everybody comfortable. You know, there's no, yeah. there's no person that I feel shouldn't be there. I, I like, I like to make sure everybody's there and that everybody's there as a team. There's no, no situation where someone feels left out or not supported in any kind of way. It's just important. It's important to me to have a wonderful and peaceful department. Yeah. I think everything's just a lot more fun and Mm -hmm. it just runs a lot smoother, doesn't it? Exactly. We're having a good time at work. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I want that experience to be definitely a a fun, a fun experience in a place that you remember and would love to come back to. Yeah. I think when people are feeling confident and safe, they create better work. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and not only that, it's a learning experience because I, I've had some people who've worked on period pieces, you know, that may have been their first time. And the, the level of excitement that they have just makes me happy that I could actually bring them in to be a part of something that they'll always remember because I remember my first time. Mm. I remember my first time and the, the level of excitement that I had, I would go home so happy because of the beautiful work that I helped create that day and just to see it on the big screen after, you know, after it's in, out in uh, distribution, just, it's just a peaceful and wonderful thing to have. So I know that that person who came for the first time and worked on that movie for the, on Bessie for the first time or Green Book for the first time or whatever it was, you know, they'll always remember that. Now, because we are always learning as artists, what is something that you've learned recently that excited you or you thought was just plain helpful? You know what? I bought in on respect sometimes 25 and 35 hairstylists and <laughs> for those huge days. And I, mm-hmm. I, I would just watch people work in the background area and I would just see that there was, that there were particular looks that were going for, but 
I was really, really pleased to see that everybody took direction, definitely, but not everybody went the same way to get that particular look. So I learned from people who I saw for the first time doing hairstyles that I've done or that other people have done. You know, they've gone totally to the left to do it. And this person went totally to the right to do it. And they ended up at the same place. So learning from other people has always been something that I have never, ever been above because in order to move forward, you have to learn Mm. things. One thing I definitely will say that respect gave me, gave me a push forward to to think outside the box because (laughs) it was one of those situations where in, in, in any film, in any project, a director can say, you know what, I think we should do this this way. And we tested it a whole nother way. So there were times when I had to pull a rabbit out of a hat, literally, literally pull a rabbit out of a hat. And I welcomed those challenges because I was able to do it. I was able to do it and do it successfully. And those things would probably stress a lot of people out. But at the end of the day, it rewarded me because it made me stronger. And I think that being, being in a position to be challenged and to think, to make you have to think outside the box is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I'm always, I'm always, I won't say I'm always prepared, but I have found out that I am always prepared by having enough of what I need, more than enough of what I need, should I say. There were people thrown in at the last minute for roles in respect. And literally I would have to go, okay, think, think, think. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what can you do for this person to achieve this look? Bring them in the trailer and my adrenaline would just go and I would make it work. And I, I just have to say right now, I have a big smile on my face because there were instances where I knew that the only thing that was going to help me through this was God. <laughs> or oh, that was going to make me able to achieve this look on this particular person. And it, mm-hmm. and it worked. And that beca- that's because I was more than ready and I was more I had more supplies than I needed to have. I had a little bit of everything that I could think of and yeah. an extra. Yeah, I think being prepared and just open for that challenge. Exactly. Like bring it. Come on, bring let's it. do this. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, exactly. And then with that I had to do wigs early on. So I had wigs, you know, on the shelves, just wigs sitting there, just never knowing who it was going to be for. But I knew that it would be used at some point. And it was. <laughs> it, it was that situation where there would be 25, 35, 45, 55 wigs just sitting there. Yeah. And they all were used, every last one of them. So being prepared is definitely key to being yeah. successful. That's awesome. Hey, um, now I was going to ask you, what is one tool that you wouldn't want to work without? And I understand that there are probably plenty, but I just want you to try and choose one. <laughs> one tool that I would not want to work without, a rat tail comb. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. And I'll tell you what happened. One time I was with rat tail, a rat tail comb was definitely one tool that I would never want to work without or have to have. But I remember being with a client and we were doing press. I remember leaving the hotel. I set her hair. And she said, you know, we'll comb it out once we get to the studio. Well, we get to the studio. I can't find my bag. Uh I left my bag in the car. We Ah. we get upstairs and things are still being set up. And she goes in and she gets makeup touched up. And I start pulling her hairpins out. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I don't know where my bag is. I need my bag. I need my bag. And I get, excuse me for a moment. I'll be right back. So I go out into the hallway and I find this little kitchen area. I find a plastic fork. I love this. (laughs) I find, Jamie, I find a plastic (laughs) fork and I go back in and I I do her comb out with a plastic fork. Oh my goodness. I love it. I do it with a plastic fork and it worked out. And she says, you did that. (laughs) She she just says, you did that. She never questioned it. You know, I got nervous, of course, because I couldn't find my bag. And of course yeah. it surfaced. It was in the car. I don't know how I left it in the car. But anyway, I combed her it's out. making it work. It's making it work. <laughs> That's my point. It's making it work. I combed yeah. her out with a plastic fork and it worked beautifully. But it's yeah. making it work. It's, got, it's trying to stay in control, not let them see you sweat. 
pull a rabbit out of your hat if you have to, but make it work. Mm-hmm. Never say, I can't say, you know what? I'm going to try and make that happen. Yeah, That's what I live by. And that's a prime yeah. example of one thing I always like to have. And that's a rat tail comb because you can do so much with it. So much. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I, I always ask people this question and I've come to the conclusion that that is my answer. I'm a, a tail comb. Cannot be without my tail comb. Yeah. And I, I, I'd feel a little naked if I didn't have just a small can of hairspray with me. Yeah. I have to say. I could do yeah. a rat tail, <laughs> small can of hairspray and a little, little thing of pomade. I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. That's what we get Good. To That's it. Good to go. And it's just, That's it's a lifesaver. Cool. It's, it's, a, it's the perfect little setback. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, now what one person would you like to hear on the podcast? Oh my gosh. Let's see. Hmm. I would love to hear, you know, you know, Michelle Chaglia? Michelle Chaglia? Yes. Yes. I would love to hear her on here because I love her work as well. She's wonderful. Well, wonderful. Lawrence, come on now. I just don't. <laughs> She's on my episode seven. It just came out on Monday. Oh, really? Uh-huh. I miss her it. and um, Aaron kruger McCash. Yeah. yeah. Love Michelle. <laughs> love Michelle. Love her work. And we worked together before in L.A. And um, I, I, we did a little bit. What was it here? Hunger Games here. Yeah, when she was here day playing a little bit on Hunger Games. Love Michelle. She's so sweet and I love her work as well. I miss that, man. <laughs> you didn't have it. It's, it's, it's up streaming. Okay. Anytime you want to listen to it. Yeah, yeah. that's my <laughs> girl. That's my girl. I love her. That's awesome. I'm yeah. on the right track then. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I love my friend Dean Banowitz. Dean um, does a lot of uh, the competition shows and I, I, work, oh, cool. I work on those with him. American Idol, okay. World of Dance, uh, So You Think You Dance, All Stars, America's Got Talent. He department heads all those shows and such a great person, such a great family over there that we have. And like I said, whenever I have time off in the summers, normally I take six weeks and I go out to LA and I day play and hang out with those guys on those shows because we have such a great time and it's so creative, yeah. such a creative team over there. That's cool. What's his name again? Dean Banowitz. I'll send you his information. I have a funny feeling that I've seen him on um, Instagram. He has a big beard. Yes, he does. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. my guy. Yeah, <laughs> That's, That's my awesome. guy. I love Dean. Dean is such a great friend and he would be so much fun. He's so much, so full of knowledge, so full of knowledge. Oh, and, cool. you know, he's awesome. I love being a part of his team, you know, being on dance shows and things like that. You have to be, you have to really think outside of the box as well because they're dancing and moving. So you have to create styles yeah. and create things that won't come off of their head. It's got a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But those are, those are my, those are my family. I love those guys very, very much. I don't get to see them much, but they, they definitely have been a blessing to me. They don't, they don't even know it. Oh, that's so cool. Well, they might now. <laughs> yeah. I would, love, <laughs> I would love to hear them on, have, uh, if you had them on. That'd be cool. Yeah. Well, Lawrence, thank you for chatting with me today. You're it's welcome, been such Jamie. a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I, I love sitting down and just talking, uh, talking hair and talking television and film. It's just like the best thing for me. It's so motivating and it excites me. Definitely excites yeah. me. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I can tell you. <laughs> You're very passionate about it. It's awesome. I love it. It's, you know, it's, it's one of those things I, I, I strived for and I got into it and you know, I'm here to stay. Yeah, I love it. I love your story. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And now, a word from our sponsor. Are you tired of having sore shoulders, neck, and a bad back? Are you fed up with clutching actor bags under your armpits whilst doing your last looks on set? And what about those frustrating moments rummaging through an overfilled shoulder bag? Sound familiar? We have the comfortable, practical, and slick solution for you. Linear Standby Belts manufactures customizable tool belts designed by hair and makeup artist Georgia Lockhart Adams. It consists of a high-quality padded belt and 12 interchangeable accessories and pouches which will hold all of your on-set needs. With a handy Velcro top on all pouches, you can swap out and change bags quickly, even hand over actor bags to your colleagues if you step away from set. Come along and join the LSB revolution. Why wait? Order your customizable tool belt today. Get 15% off when you visit linearbelts.com forward slash last looks. You can find that link in our show notes. 
Okay, Last Looks crew, thanks for listening. And remember, if you love it, share it. A quick scroll down and you'll find our show notes. Or maybe you'd like to give your support and leave a five-star review. Go on, I know you want to. Search The Last Looks podcast on Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok, whichever one tickles your fancy. And a massive shout out to the husband, Brett Stanley. Without his patience and tech support, this whole podcast situation simply does not happen and cheers to Liliana Rose for her fabulous voice acting talents okay last looks crew that's a wrap for me I don't need to be told twice to get out of here so bye I'll catch you on the flip side that's a wrap people